Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the University of Aberdeen. Uh, my name is Dr. Travis Potts. I am the interim director for the Center for Energy Transition and I am in the School of Geosciences in the discipline of geography. So I'm a geographer uh, and I work on looking at the social, uh, economic and political aspects of energy and environmental governance more broadly, particularly around marine environments. But today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the trends and challenges around the concept of energy transition uh, and what that means for a place like Aberdeen, where you'll be coming to visit us soon. And what are some of the challenges and topics and issues you can work on as a student, as a postgraduate student? So a bit of an overview of some trends from the UK level and looking at some of the challenges for the region. I'm zoning in on a topic called the just transition, where, is where most of the work that I do sits. Uh, and then just a, a brief introduction to uh, the Centre for Energy Transition and, and how you can engage when you come and, and join us. So if we start with this chart by Climate, Ac Climate Action Tracker, we are looking at here, sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> we are looking here uh, at projected global greenhouse emissions in gigatons per year. You can see us here at, uh, at 2020. This is really a crunch point. Now under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change the and the uh, Paris Accord, of which there will be uh, the annual meeting held in Glasgow, COP26 next year in 2021. Where do we go forward in this in this situation in terms of global greenhouse emissions? Now, the current sort of baseline is that we're going to exceed um, the, the target and be around four degrees, which is catastrophic essentially for, for life on Earth and, and, and the human systems that it supports. If we look at the current policies, of governments around the world, it puts us in this sort of blue envelope around 2.7 to 3.1 degrees, and that still exceeds the legal requirements for the Framework Convention on Climate Change, where we aim to limit global warming from greenhouse gases to two degrees with an aspiration of 1.5 degrees. So even with current policies, we're going to overshoot that. If we're going to hit a two degree consistent target or a 1.5 degree consistent target, then you see by the yellow and the green lines here, we have to really bend the curve down in terms of carbon emissions. A two degree target really says we have to get to net zero sometime in the second half of this century, around 2070 to 2100. A 1.5 degree target, which essentially is much more safer for our economy and our environment and our society, essentially means we have to hit a net zero target or zero target by around 2050 to 2060. And that is where the concept of net zero has emerged from. That is, it is a balancing between the emissions that we produce and the ability to remove them from the atmosphere. So we have a net zero carbon emissions. And that is where both the UK and Scotland have set why they have set their net zero targets, which is by 2050 for the UK and by 2045 in Scotland. So uh, slightly ahead of the, the global ambition there. What does net zero mean for looking forward to 2050? And this is from a lot of great work you can find on the committee from climate change, the independent advisor to parliament on, on net zero. And the key way we do it is this energy transition that is moving from the current system of energy production, distribution and use, a very much centralised and fossil fuel heavy system to one that is decentralised, decarbonised and digitalised. A very, very different system in place where we meet our net zero goals. So what are some of the things that have to happen? Well, major, major changes across economy and society for this to happen. So some of the things here we've listed, electrical generation capacity, our, our ability to generate electrical power, will have to at least double, but more likely go to triple or quadruple the amount of electrical power that we generate, primarily to meet increased demand 
from things such as electric vehicles, for example, across the population, or electrification of heating in homes, which is one of our major carbon and sources of carbon emissions, electrification in industry, of industry as well, another major sector. So we need to actually radically increase the amount of power we produce. That, of course, has to be renewables, not fossil fuel based. As a part of this, we have to increase offshore wind by 40 gigawatts. That's the new current UK target, 40 gigawatts of production by 2030. So in 10 years time, we currently have 10 gigawatts of offshore wind in the water. So we have to quadruple that. In Scotland, it's an even bigger challenge. We have one gigawatt in the water and the target is about 10 gigawatts in Scotland. So a tenfold increase in offshore wind in Scotland. Carbon capture and storage or carbon capture use and storage, CCUS has to go from zero, as it is at the moment, to 180 million tonnes of carbon per annum to be able to capture carbon from various industrial processes or bioenergy production processes and lock it away underground. And it's an it's a, it's a, it's a untested and slightly controversial technology. We have to forest huge areas of the UK, planting trees, planting new forests from 10,000 to 50,000 hectares per annum. Nearly every home in the UK will need to be installed with some form of low carbon heat. Now, we'll come back to this, but what form of low carbon heat is really open for debate and discussion at the moment, whether this is fitting homes with heat pumps, which uh, you draw upon electrical power to heat homes, or blending hydrogen into the gas networks, for example, and using hydrogen boilers. And there is a lot of debate, both in terms of the economics, the politics, and the engineering aspects here, which really makes it a very exciting area for, for students to get involved in. We have to go from about 200,000 zero uh, net electric cars, zero carbon cars, to over 35 million electric vehicles uh, in the next 20 to 30 years. That is a huge change. Large scale landscape change affecting 20% of agricultural land and major social and, and, and societal and structural changes in, in the use of energy, both in how we produce it, how we distribute it, how we store it, and how we use it from the demand side as well. Everything from housing, transport, how we move, how we travel, how we work, uh, and even if things such things, how we eat in terms of the energy intensity of how we eat. So these are major changes across, across all aspects of life. And it really represents an enormous opportunity here for students to get involved in some of these topics. We've done quite well in dropping emissions uh, in the UK from the power sector. So you can see this red line here. Uh, again, so the source is the, the Committee on Climate Change 2019. So we've really dropped, we've really decarbonized a great deal of our, of our um, electricity by import, you know, building in renewables. But we can see we have some major areas that have not changed at all in nearly 20 years. Those flat lines here, and that is transport. We really haven't solved the transport problem yet. Industry, we've had some slight improvement in, in emissions. Uh, and homes actually have gone up, heating essentially, uh, heating and space heating in homes. So these are key areas that we need require innovation, technology and social transformation. Where are we going into the future? Well, at the moment in here, we were at this juncture point where we're going to see increasing use. This is in terms of uh, generation by technology, in terms of electricity. We're going to see more and more renewables in the system, whether that's offshore wind growing, onshore wind, solar. There's potential there for wave and tidal, although wave and tidal are about 10 to 15 years behind in terms of commercial viability and cost. Uh, and we're going to see a still a role for gas going forward, but there will be a decline in the use of gas. And it's a very controversial uh, and um, sensitive area looking forward, looking at future oil and gas demand going forward. And there are a whole range of scenarios and forecasts about this. Uh, how much oil and gas will we need going forward over the next decades? interpretation of, across many, we'll probably see a stabilizing uh, our, uh, of our demands in the next 10 years for oil and gas, and then a, a long term decline in the demand for oil and gas. But also beneath that is our, our, 
ability to produce oil and gas off the UK continental shelf will consistently drop and lower. So our demand will slow down uh, and go down, but actually our supply from the UK context will drop even more quickly than that, which opens up the door then for we need to import these. And again, a stronger argument for ensuring our energy system in the UK is diversified to provide security going forward. So what does this mean like a place like the northeast of Scotland for Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, a place that you will relocate to and move to and work and study in? There is a huge amount of opportunities here for exploring some of these topics. If we look at investment, uh, global investment is slowing. And if you look at the right hand graph here, we've had uh, major challenges from both the COVID crisis and also from the drop in demand for oil and gas and also the dropping, the, the severe drop in the price of oil as well. All of that had resulted in a slowing down of investment. Yet, if we look at the, the green part of this chart, uh, which is renewable power, or the orange part of this chart, which is electrical networks, so grids, investment in our grid infrastructure, we need to double, in some places, triple our investment globally in order to meet the challenge. We need to provide the funding and the resources to make this happen. But at a time, we are currently in a time of economic crisis around the world. The good news is, at least from the side of renewable technologies, that the price of renewable technology has dropped significantly uh, over the past 20 years, particularly in things like solar and offshore wind. We have seen a huge drop as we've seen government support, innovation, competition, standardization across the sector. So it's quite an exciting time for renewable technologies, but we still have some major hurdles to chase. Places like the northeast of Scotland, uh, there is a, a boom in the offshore wind sector. And this is one of the key uh, industrial sectors that Scotland is supporting in terms of our green recovery and approaching the energy transition. The Scottish government only a few weeks ago released what's called the sectoral plan for marine energy. So on the left here, this map of Scotland, and you can see these are areas of where potential offshore wind farms will be located going forward, not particularly in every spot there, but these are the areas that can be consented for offshore wind projects, large scale offshore wind projects. So you can see around us here in, in Aberdeen, we are really going to be a global centre. We're already one of the world leaders in offshore wind development in the UK, and this is going to be further deepened and expanded in Scotland with significant areas out there for offshore wind. And of course, we have to manage the impacts of offshore wind, both in terms of marine planning and inter interactions in the marine environment with other sectors like fisheries, tourism and conservation. Our target is between 8 and 11 gigawatts of offshore wind in the next 10 years. That's a part of an overall 40 gigawatt target. So this is both floating wind and fixed wind. Most of our renewable energy at the moment in this top graph here, the green chart here is onshore. So if you do drive around parts of Scotland, particularly the northeast, you'll see many, many, many wind farms uh, on the land and in the hills. But most of the forecasted growth for, uh, for renewable technologies will be in the offshore and the marine environment. We hear a lot of talk about hydrogen. Again, Aberdeen is positioning itself as to be one of the leader innovators in the UK, not the only place, but certainly one of the top two or three areas uh, to deliver the production of hydrogen. Hydrogen is talked about a lot because it can potentially influence all areas of our energy system from how we heat our homes, from things like heavy goods transport, trains, planes and boats, for providing an energy source or an industrial feedstock for heavy industry, for example, the production of steel or the production of ammonia or the production of cement. So hydrogen actually is a very versatile um, uh, energy vector issue and we produce it by different ways. Currently, there are two key ways going forward for low carbon hydrogen. That is blue hydrogen, essentially, which is produced from methane, but the carbon is captured and stored from that process generally considered the, uh, the, the cheaper of the options at the moment. And then green hydrogen, the gold standard, which is a hydrogen produced by renewable energy, say offshore wind and electrolysis of water, of seawater, to produce essentially hydrogen and water as an output. 
so with no carbon emissions at all, but is generally considered more expensive at this point in time. And this graph on the left shows that over time, green hydrogen, as we develop more standardized approaches, upscaled approaches and support approaches, green hydrogen is expected to come down in cost over the next 10 years, where it starts to become comparable with blue hydrogen going forward. But, and again, another sector within Aberdeen that is of enormous opportunity. Uh, we have various student societies and student engagement projects around hydrogen. We have a hydrogen vehicle team uh, in engineering. And there are a lot of ways to a discussion group. There are a lot of ways to get involved with hydrogen issues in Aberdeen. In terms of where we go for employment, and this is a key part of what we call the just transition, ensuring that workers in energy or people who work in energy industries or fossil fuel industries are not left behind by these changes and we see massive unemployment like we did with say the glasgow shipyards or the in the, the the northern england the southern scotland coal fields uh, back in the 80s where workers and communities are devastated by abrupt changes in industries we don't want to do that with the energy transition we want to make sure that there is uh, substantial employment opportunities and retraining opportunities for workers and communities and there are some worrying signs here potentially about uh, ab particularly in the covid crisis that there have been major changes to to to, to job growth uh, estimations of up to 30,000 jobs could be lost over the next 18, 18 months in the energy industry. And unions are very concerned about this as well, as this could potentially risk extinguishing uh, the potential for a just transition for workers as employment is lost and investment goes down. So we have to come up with some very interesting policy propositions and work with communities, with industry and government on the social, political, uh, the regulatory and the economic aspects of the energy transition. Of course, a lot of interest there, potential projects, working in with such places such as geography or the business school or in social sciences as well. So energy transition isn't just a technological aspect, technological project, it's also very much a social and an economic and a policy project as well. And both those sides are really important to make this, these grand changes happen. If we look at what this means in a place like Aberdeen or, or the northeast of Scotland, in terms of the oil and gas workforce, we need to focus on acceleration of short term job creation. This will likely come from areas such as decommissioning and offshore wind. We need certainty over what technologies will provide the energy transition in the future, uh, and it's such as hydrogen, for example. And we need to also ensure that we are building and manufacturing things within the UK. At the moment, uh, and this is part of the social justice aspect or the, the, the just transition aspect, wind farms might be put into the water in Scotland and we have big plans for them, but all the components for wind farms are manufactured overseas and so we don't see those supply chain benefits. We really need to think about supporting skills and innovation in small in SMEs. This includes SMEs that are developed by you guys, by the students going through doing your postgraduate research and learning to think in terms of being enterprising and developing innovative ideas. And we will support that in your studies across the board, across the university. This is where some of the radical and really interesting ideas come about in energy transition. Energy transition isn't just a large scale industrial project focusing on wind, hydrogen and CCUS is actually all about the small radical diffuse innovations that can change the market. Lots of small innovations built by smart, agile companies, particularly ones that are developed by students when they finish their studies. Things such as energy efficiency, retrofitting, green infrastructure, uh, smart energy networks, artificial intelligence, energy integration, social justice, social activism and organisation, a whole range of different areas and opportunities there. This is really important to address the skills and employment crisis, and we have very poor data in this, this topic. And also critically, we need to promote genuine dialogue uh, and participatory democracy around the choices that affect communities, because communities have been shut out from this process. Uh, and we really need to hear what the, what the vision is for communities who are affected by these changes and how we can have that influence policy and planning going forward. So these are the, some of the key aspects of what we call a just energy transition. Uh, and a place like Aberdeen, this is really important. We have areas of 
wealth and, and poverty in the city, like many cities across the UK. This is from the Scottish Index of, of Deprivation. And we have to ensure that the opportunities that come from the energy transition actually benefit everybody across the board. So we have to address some key issues like fuel poverty, for example, or fuel of energy affordability, uh, access to skills and work, educational attain attainment. So that's why um, this, this supports the idea that energy transition is much a social, uh, a social transformation and a social aspect and an economic aspect as it is an engineering and a technological aspect. And we're really keen to bring these two sides of the things together. That just supports that, that slide there. And some of the technologies are not universally supported. We have variation in what people think across the UK about different technologies that support the just transition. This is from a really interesting piece of work called uh, the UK uh, Climate uh, Community Discussion, the Climate Assembly UK, and the link is there. And you can see some technologies such as offshore wind have very strong support. 80% of, of, of the participants in the Climate Assembly strongly agree, agreed that these were part of the energy mix going forward. Other, other technologies such as carbon capture and storage, you can see were far, far less popular. In fact, most of the, the participants in that didn't agree, strongly agreed, disagreed or disagreed or unsure about technologies such as carbon capture and storage. Yet carbon capture and storage is built as one of the key industrial sectors for this region. So we have some very interesting work to do and there's a lot more work to be done on social attitudes, on social acceptability of technology and of edu education and engagement around these things. So finally, um, I'd like to introduce you all to the Centre for Energy Transition. The Centre is, I'm the interim director of the Centre for Energy Transition, and the Centre brings together a whole range of themes uh, across the university. We have eight different themes and eight different schools involved in this centre. So this includes engineering, geosciences, biology, uh, social sciences, uh, geography, uh, economics, law, um, business school. So we have a real community of researchers engaging in these topics across these different themes. We have four sectoral themes and four cross-cutting themes there, everything from renewables to how the oil and gas industry itself engages with transition to energy system governance and demand and markets. So there are real opportunities for you to engage with the centre. We have we run a week, a, a fortnightly seminar series. We're keen to get students involved. We're going to be running a energy transition fundamentals course, which is a voluntary course uh, next June. Um, that's just recently been approved. So you that's potentially will be available to your students to do a, a, a voluntary primer for one week that will be run um, by a major energy industry. So there's a huge amount of opportunity to engage in this process and talk to us and engage researchers from across different schools because the interdisciplinary approach is key to how we do this. And I hope I've convinced you of that today. So uh, we'd like to look forward to welcome you, welcoming you to the university. If you want to know more about the Centre for Energy Transition, uh, look at some of the latest seminars. We've got YouTube clips of some seminars, which I'd really recommend you watch. Some of our reports and outputs and activities and opportunities for you to be involved. There's our website, abdn.ac.uk slash energy. So thank you very much for the opportunity to talk on, uh, today. And I hope look forward to meeting you when you do come and join us here in Aberdeen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Water break. So a couple of questions here. Um, anonymous, which countries do you think are further ahead with energy transition and why? Yeah, really good question. One of the key things of energy transition is that it is, while it's a universal concept, so it applies to all countries, that we have to transition as a, as a planet uh, to, to eventually to net zero, the transition will happen at different speeds in different places. So, for example, when it comes to the UK, I would consider that the UK is one of a small handful of countries that are that are leading in this transition. We've developed energy resources for for for, for decades, uh, and we also have the ability, the economic ability, and the, and the and the social and the political ability to actually make that transition faster than say for countries who are still currently developing. 
their, their energy resource or developing their economies. So that would mean, for example, a place like um, uh, Guyana, which is a good example in South America, have recently discovered very large reservoirs of oil. But they're also one of the poorest countries in, 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 uh, in South America. So we have to ensure that those who are responsible for the bulk of carbon emissions globally, essentially the countries in the global north, do make harder and faster transitions. And, and then we work with countries from the developing world to ensure that their economic development is as clean and as green as possible, but allowing for some development of around use and use of fossil fuels in that process. So which countries are further ahead? I think UK is definitely one of the one of the world leaders in this process. Uh, and it's a great place to pick up and learn about some of these topics. Uh, Europe as a whole is, is pushing ahead. Uh, very strongly with, with energy transition, has a lot of supporting research opportunities and engagement opportunities and educational op opportunities. Although within Europe, it's very diverse how different countries do it. For example, uh, countries like Poland uh, or Spain have enormous coal resources uh, and they're starting to, and Germany as well, and they're starting to move away from those resources. So there are many different debates in European countries. Some countries which are more problematic such as Australia and the US are very interesting to watch because they have a different debate around climate change. Uh, and I, as an Australian, I, I'm quite plugged into debates back, back in Australia and we're very slow to act on, 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 on climate policy uh, at a national level, but transition is happening probably more at a local level. So transition is lumpy. It happens at different places at different speeds, which is a, a really interesting point for when we're starting to look into it. How will we, another question here, how will the centre engage with the energy industry in Aberdeen? Yeah, we have ongoing discussions with the energy industry here in Aberdeen through, through the centre and through our theme champions who work across those different themes. So we're engaging with many, many companies here from, uh, the, uh, from the oil and gas side, some of the majors such as Shell, BP, Total. We're also engaging with some of the many of the companies who are working on offshore wind and renewable energy, such as Vattenfall. We're also engaging with companies such as uh, Pale Blue Dot, who are developing CCUS. Uh, we're also engaging very strongly with governments in, 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 in the region. So Aberdeen City and Shire Council were supporting their work on energy transition and the policies that they're developing to support that. Uh, we're up engaging with the Scottish government and the UK government. So we are really a hub for broader uh, engagement with industry. Uh, and this includes getting industry involved in coming in and speaking to students, having opportunities to engage with students. For example, our energy transition pr um, primer course, which we run next in next June for a week, which is voluntary, but, but a credit bearing course, you'll be able to engage directly with a major energy company in discussing transition and how major energy companies deal with transition in their corporate strategy. So we're very plugged in to the industrial uh, and the political debates here in the Centre for Energy Transition. Aberdeen is a great place to be to discovering it. It really is ground zero for discussing uh, and, and looking at how these things will develop. What degree would you recommend for moving into a career in energy transition? Well, that's a, that's that's a tough question, actually. It depends on what sort of discipline you're interested in. As I've hopefully convinced you today, energy transition cuts across many disciplines. It's an interdisciplinary topic. So uh, I would recommend you go to our Center for Energy Transition website, www.abdn slash ac slash uk slash energy. A Center for Energy Transition there, we list on our website the 33 different MSc courses that you can apply for if you're interested in energy transition. If you're interested in more the engineering side of things, there are a range of programs such as renewable energy engineering uh, courses. If you're interested in more the social change and the policy aspects um, or the community aspects of transitions, you could look at environmental partnership management in geosciences, or you could look at oil and gas enterprise management in geosciences if you're working with the current energy industry. Uh, there are a whole range of programs in law and social sciences as well. So really across the board, we have a very big portfolio that all touch upon and draw in upon energy transition. So go to the website and have a look. Um, how realistic is that? Scroll down here. 
realistic is that future discoveries of hydrocarbons will be left in the ground or the million dollar question? Well, we are going to need hydrocarbons in some form for the next few decades. So in terms of leaving them in the ground in the short term, I think it's completely unrealistic. We still need to transport ourselves, whether it's by trains, buses, cars, and sometimes airplanes, we still need to heat and heat our homes. The predominant way we heat our homes in the UK is the gas grid. So as long as we have demands for heating and transport in the next few decades, we will have demand for hydrocarbons. Now, this is one of the key secrets, of, I think, about the energy transition that I've been that I've discovered through my research is that change for moving away from fossil fuels comes from increasing demand, pushing more renewables and pushing more hydro, uh, pushing more zero or low carbon options in to society. So increasing the uptake, for example, of electric vehicles, of providing economic incentives for houses to switch from gas to hydrogen or to uh, electric um, heat pumps, for example, to heat our homes. But at the moment, these things are expensive and generally inaccessible. So we have to come up with the social and the economic and the political drivers to ensure uptake. When we see demand for low carbon products surge and increase, then we'll see the drop of hydro the demand in hydrocarbons, and then we'll see it becomes uneconomic to exploit them because the demand is for low carbon. So that's why it's really important to work with the social transformation side of things. Eventually, yes, we will only need them. It's still important that we need hydrocarbons for important feedstocks, for chemical aspects, uh, and production of a whole range of different products, for example, in, 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 in manufacturing or in food or in health, for example. Still will be a valuable resource, but we just might not burn it for energy. Okay, uh, South Manat Mayar from South Sudan, IPG, great. How can Africa benefit the global energy? I'm not quite sure I understand that question, but Africa has a key role in this in the green economy. Well, I would posit back to you, uh, Macbeal, I think hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, is that how can we ensure that development in Africa is low carbon and green and full of potential? Okay, we have a number of students working on this. Uh, uh, both at the PGT and the PhD level, uh, so we can have a really interesting conversation around this. How do we ensure that I think green growth in Africa has to come from within? It has to come, not be imposed from Europe, not be imposed from the UK, but has to be fostered from within. Now, if within that, there's going to be a certain amount of development of oil and gas resources to support those growing economies, to support their desire for energy. What we need to do is ensure that there is a clear transition away from these resources in the long term. For example, building in things like carbon capture and storage from the outset and using the investment from oil and gas to build the infrastructure for things like electric vehicles for renewable energy. It has to go hand in hand. We have to make sure that different countries across the board, not only Africa, but across the board, have these green growth opportunities as well as the current opportunities in oil and gas exploitation. Again, it's not something that's going to happen in the short term. It's going to take decades. But that process begins now. Really good question. Uh, and the IPG course, I, I know very well, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for students on the IPG as well as all of our energy courses to come and do our, our voluntary uh, fundamentals course in energy transition as a part of their studies going forward. So you have that knowledge as well. Some really, really good questions there, folks. So keep them coming. So everybody, I'd just like to reiterate, if you want to learn more about energy transition as a concept and some of the projects that we're doing uh, and some of, of the contacts point, we have a, do visit our website. We have a staff uh, registry of all those stuff, all the stuff here working across our eight themes. Our eight themes for energy transition in the university are, putting myself on the spot here, <laughs> renewable generation, 
carbon capture use and storage and natural capital. So we're interested in also the ecosystem aspects, the natural aspects, say forestry of how systems absorb carbon, hydrogen economy, oil and gas in transition. So understanding the role of the oil and gas industry in energy transition, the circular economy, including decommissioning, uh, smart systems, integra energy integration and digitalization, um, demand and markets, because we need to understand the demand side of energy as much as we need to, to uh, increase the supply side. How do we engage with users and their choices? What options are available for citizens and consumers and businesses and industries for their variety of low carbon energy needs? and energy system governance. A lot of the questions you've asked here really relate to governance of the transition, whether that's governance in Scotland or Aberdeen, governance in the UK, governance in various countries such as South Sudan or various countries in, in Africa, or governance at a global context through the United Nations Framework Convention and the Paris Accord. So governance is a key bit. How do we ensure that it's a just transition, an engaged transition, uh, an economically viable transition, uh, a transition that affects poverty and, and, and gets countries and regions out of poverty and shares opportunities widely. So as you can see, there are a huge amount of different aspects of transition to engage in, whether you're an engineer, a geoscientist, school of business, a geographer, social scientist, or working in studies in law, all have a really relevant and interesting role to play in transition and, and Aberdeen is a great place to come in and have those discussions. Right, well, there's no more questions come in. Um, so I think we could probably wrap it up there, folks. Uh, thank you, Anna. Yep, there's our link to our web page. Do, do have a look. There's a lot of content. We run a seminar series every two weeks. Uh, so, um, and we post those seminars on our web page as well. So we've had two seminars recently. One seminar has been on um, uh, the circular economy and opportunities for the industrial recycling of electric vehicle batteries. That was by uh, Eve Wildman, really interesting seminar on the chemistry of, of, of electric vehicle batteries. And the seminar we had last week was on uh, oil and gas exploration and limiting oil and gas exploration in the Arctic. A legal, a legal and a regulatory and governance seminar by Dar uh, Daria Shapovalova from the School of Law. A really interesting uh, talk by Daria on, on oil and gas in the Arctic and how we can look at regulating that. So they're on, on our website. You can go to you and have links to YouTube. We also participated in the Festival of Social Science a few weeks ago where we had a really interesting panel um, that I chaired uh, with um, uh, um, input from some of our academics, Dr. Thomas Musner from the School of Law, uh, Dr. David Toke from the School of Social Sciences, uh, and some local political and community representatives discussing what energy transition means in Aberdeen. So, and that's also a link to that is on our website. So heaps of content if you want to explore this, as well as just current news and views from reports and published and papers that people have published. So we, we are a hive of activity. We're one of the leading global centers for looking at energy transition. And we're really looking forward to having you here and to keep those discussions going. It's really important to us that we have students communicating across different schools. So whatever part of energy transition you're looking at from engineering to so-and-so or geosciences or social sciences, our role in the center is to encourage this cross-linking of ideas and debates for students from different schools. And you'll find that something quite a unique offering what we do here in Aberdeen. So we really like you to be a part of that conversation with us. And there are many opportunities uh, to work in energy transition roles, both as the oil and gas sector itself transforms around the world to diversify from oil and gas into low carbon sources, to work in government, national, local government, or to work in civil society uh, and communities around energy transition. We can we can set you up really well for the for a career in energy transition studies. OK, that's all the questions.
but it's been nice um, meeting every you all and do 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 drop me a line when you do arrive in Aberdeen and we look forward to uh, discussing these topics some more.